Hello and good evening to everyone who's logging on here to the Central Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study. My name is Wes Garland and I am the pulpit minister here for the Central Church of Christ. And if you are visiting with us, if you're not a member here at Central, we just want to let you know that you are truly an honored guest. And if you are ever coming through the Sarah Land, Alabama area, we hope and pray that you'll stop by and be part of us so we can get to know you and, and also you get to know us. Tonight I'm doing the study for the reason that Clifford is not doing well. He is not feeling well. He's, he's, he got sick yesterday, and, uh, and I, our prayers go out to him. Brother, if you're watching, we just want to let you know that we love you and that we can't wait to have you back. Um, if there's anything at all we can do for you, please just let us know. But tonight, uh, typically you'd be getting a lesson from Clifford on the 12 Minor Prophets. And with that being the case, I'm not going to touch that with a, with a 10 foot pole because he's done such a great job with that. So I wanted to bring about a lesson tonight that I think would be um, something really encouraging, something that I think would be uh, something that we could really learn a whole lot from and really just evaluate ourselves on this. If you have your Bibles, I hope and pray that you'll take out your Bible, paper, and pen and go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 25. Psalm 25, you know that today is, at the time of this recording, is, is Inauguration Day. And we're having a change of power. We're having a lot of unsettling times that we've lived through from last year all the way up now through this year so far. And um, it, it can be some trouble sometimes. And just some of the things that they're going to be pushing to, that goes against God's law that we already know they're going to be pushing for. And, thought, and guys, I just hope and pray that you'll go ahead and pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, that they'll have a heart to look to God for guidance, uh, because that's really what we all need. But I want to ask you a simple question. In times like this, what makes me actually trust in God? What makes me trust in God? What makes you trust in God? Because I think that, that is, as, that's an honest question. Why is it the case that in times of uh, despair and times of, of persecution and things like that, what, what causes us to finally find peace? And I know that, that this last Sunday we talked here at the Central Church of Christ, I preached a lesson on finding peace within the midst of a storm. And, and the thing is, we need to understand some things, just as David did right here in Psalm 25, that... He's going to be making some statements here in, in respect to because of who you are, God, I'm going to plead this with you. I'm going to do this with my life. I'm going to give you totally to you. And so with that being the case, I want us to go ahead and dive uh, deep into this psalm. In Psalm 25, if you'll go ahead and if you haven't done so, go ahead and turn your Bibles there. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to just bring out some of the responses that David has. And as we're going through this, we're also going to be taking a look at why he says he's doing this. The very first thing you actually see here is that he says in verse number one, he says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. What would cause an individual to simply give his soul, give his eternal being, his eternal life, his, his actual being itself to finally just say, God, I lift up my soul to you. I'm putting that within your hands. Well, let's go a little bit further. Notice what else he says. Look at verse 2. Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Here he's battling a, a, a situation where he's saying there's a lot of enemies that are actually going up against him. And he says, God, I put my trust in you and let me not be ashamed. You know, I think it's very interesting when we look at the phrase, let me not be ashamed. You know, what, what he's actually saying here is that because I put my trust in you, God, help me to never be ashamed for me doing that. And there's a reason why, and he's going to get into it here in just a little bit. He also says in verse number four, show me your ways. When, when David is, is going through some trials and tribulations in life, he says, I want you to show me your ways, God. 
Why? Because, you know, if you ever think that the, the ways of God are always going to be right, even in the Old Testament, numerous times you actually see that His commandments to the children of Israel is for their good. If you understand that the way in which He's going to uh, lead our lives is always going to be in the right way, then why in the world would we not want to search out His ways? He says, I don't want you just to talk to me about it. I just don't want you to have my mind just guess about what your way may be. God, I want you to show me your ways. On top of it, in verse number four as well, he says, on top of that, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. I want you to instruct me, God. I want you to just sit down with me and show me. And not only that, I want you to teach me. Why? Because the fact is, what, what you've heard me say numerous times, you, you cannot practice what you don't know, right? Now, not, on, not, not on, only is the case that we need to be shown really what His way is, but He also says, I want you to teach me your ways. I want you to give me the knowledge, but I also want you to give me the understanding and therefore put about the wisdom on knowing how to go in your ways, to go in your paths. He even says in verse number 5, he says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. You know, I think it's very interesting, friends, as, as we are looking at this. He says, I don't want you just to show me. I don't want you just to teach me because I, I, don't, I don't want to just have the knowledge of saying, man, okay, I know what God's will is. You know, how many times have you ever heard individuals say this, that I've read the Bible all day long, I've read the Bible all my life, but yet they're in religious error. Well, the fact is, they're not putting to action what they're reading. And friends, that can also be for us as well. How many times have we been guilty of knowing what the Bible says, but in all reality, we're just not living it. We're not taking those steps to really do what God wants us to do. Well, the fact is, what David says right here, he says, lead me. And he says, and on you, God, I wait all the day. Remember how Isaiah made the statement, teach me, Lord, to wait. You know, that's a, that's a very, very important thing for us to learn to do. And you ought to ask this question, why? Why is it so important for us to learn this? Because when we learn to wait on God, then we find out that God Himself has a particular way that He does things. He has His own time frame. Uh, his time frame is not my time frame. It's, remember what Second Peter talks about, that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day? The fact of the matter is that He's trying to emphasize the fact that He is on a different time schedule than us. He says, God, I'm oppressed. I've got troubles in my life. I've got, I've got things in my life that I, that's really making me discomfortable. But Father, he says, on you I'll wait all the day. That's a lesson we need to learn. What causes David to say such things as this? Let's go a little bit further with this. He also says in verse number 11, he says, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. You know, we understand the word iniquity to mean sin. And he says, I want you to pardon my iniquities. And he, he just comes out and says, it is great. It's, it's something that I, I can't save myself. Only you have the power and the ability to take my iniquities and pardon those things and we all know what the word pardon means. The word pardon simply means to do away with, to, to make it as if we had never been guilty of that ever before. Another word for this is, is justified. Just if I'd never sinned. You know, I, he says, pardon my iniquity. Why did he go to him? Well, we're going to get to that. In verse number 15, he also read, My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the nest. Why is David's eyes constantly ever towards the Lord? 
It's because of who he is, and we're going to get to that here in just a second. In verse number 20, he says, Keep my soul and deliver me. You know, I, I want you to think about this. If he says here to keep my soul, that simply means to take hold of it. I want you to protect it. I want you to guard it. Why did he give his whole entire life to the point of where, remember how he just said in verse number one, that to you I lift my soul. He says, I want, I, I've got protection within you, God. I, I've got that, that protection that, that guards me from what's going on in life. In your grasp, I, I'm never going to not be protected. What causes an individual to do just this? Also in verse number 20, after he says, keep my soul and deliver me, he says, let me not be ashamed. There that phrase is again, for I put my trust in you. Why do I trust God? Why do I put my whole entire life within his grasp? Why did David do that? The very last thing that he says here goes right there along with what was just said there in, uh, in the previous verse. He says, redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. In verse number 21, he says, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. I want to ask you this simple question. Do we have the heart of what David has right here? Do we have the heart that says that God, I know that if it be my will, then I know that my will will be something totally different. I know that my will will be one that, that we would change things in a more rapid state. If it be my will, then I don't like going through persecution and trials and tribulations. And so if I could stop that, I'd go ahead and stop it right here, right now. I just don't like it. It's unpleasant for me. And I think that'd be the same thing for you as well. But what did David just say to God? He says, God, I'm in a lot of trouble. I want you to deliver me. I want you to pardon me. I want you to keep me. I'm going to put my eyes upon you. I'm going to trust in you. Lord, just help me to wait on you. As you know, David didn't have that good of a life in respect to enemies and things. As soon as he killed Goliath, remember how King Saul was on him right after that, after the people started saying that, that King Saul killed his thousands, but, but David his ten thousands, and that got all jealous, and, and it God even got to the point of where he started running for his life, and two times he, he escaped Saul's. I mean, he could, have, he could have killed Saul two times, but he went ahead and pardoned him. He's trying to show the people that I'm trying to live my own life. I could have done what, I, if it was my will, I would have done a long time ago, but I didn't. Lord, help me to see your way. Help me to learn your path. Show me mercy. Show me greatness. And that's exactly what we're talking about right here. And what would actually cause David to go through all of this to make the responses that he has from him to God? Well, it all comes down to what he says right here. When you look at God's descriptions on really what he is, how he is describing God and what he actually does for mankind, no wonder David had the heart where he says that I want to do your will. I want you to notice with me. If you look at verse number 5, he, remember how he says there, lead me in your truth and teach me. Now watch this. He says, for you, God, are the God of my salvation. You are the God of my salvation. When you think about God being the God of our salvation, that simply means that He is the one and the only one in which I can get pardoned from my sin. He is the source that has the ability to take what is against me and just wash that out. The only reason why I can get to heaven is because of His grace, His goodness to give me a chance. He is my anchor. He is the God of my salvation. 
He also says in verse number six and seven, remember how he says this, after he says that for you are the God of my salvation, on you I'll wait all the day, verse five. Look at verse six. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from old. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of a hiccup, but we're going to keep on going on. But he says right here in verse 6 and 7, he says, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are of old. He says, Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness's, uh, goodness's sake, O Lord. I, I want you to notice something. He says, your tender mercy, your loving kindness. What type of God do we serve? Do we serve a God that is, that is a vengeful God, one that is always just evil, or not evil, but, but always desiring to punish people? Do we serve a God that just cannot wait to do harm to somebody who's against His will? Is that the type of God that we serve? Absolutely not. But yet we serve a God that is all about tender mercies, Loving kindness. And I think it's something that is, is something to really understand that He's a good God. He's a God that wants the best for us. He wants to do what is right for us. He wants to help us any way that we possibly can. In verse number 8, we also read here that He is good and upright. He says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He teaches sinners in his way. And, and I want you to notice this. As he starts talking about how he is good and upright, I want you to notice what good and uprightness actually does. If you are good and upright, what do you do? You teach others that same way. You don't have this haughty-minded uh, thought of that about yourself saying, oh, look, I am so righteous. I am good and I'm upright. Look at me. No, what do you do? You help teach others the same way. I mean, I've got to ask this question. How, how do you think this nation would change if the church itself was to stop looking at just their own personal lives and start trying to reach out and tell other people how to be upright in themselves? You think it would make a big change on people's lives? You think it would be a big change for the U.S.? Oh, you better believe it. We need to stop looking at ourselves and start looking about how God is and try to mimic those attributes as well. Look at verse number 9. He says, the humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Uh, notice what he said. He said, the humble, what does he do? He guides. Sometimes, friends, it, it is the case that we might need to do something further than just telling somebody what they need to do. Sometimes we may need to grab their hand and show them the way. Guide them. And see, that's what God does for us. He, he's one who is a God of salvation. He is a merciful God. He's a loving God. He's a good God. He's a good and upright God. He teaches His people. He guides them. He takes them by the hand to teach them their way. But at the same time, notice what else He says. He says in verse number 10, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep His covenant and His testimony. The paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. He's never going to lead you down the wrong road. He's never going to lead you down a road that is, a, is going to try to bring about vengeance and things. He's going to try to show you mercy. See, you think about the goodness of God, a God that is a God of mercy, a God of goodness, a God of uprightness, the God of truth. Friends, there is a stable rightness with that, isn't there? You never have to question if the way that God's going to lead you is going to be down the wrong road. He's going to lead you down the right road. You know, I, I, I was told something um, years ago, and, it's, and it, it stuck with me. The, the person said this. If, if it was the case, and this is just a hypothetical because it's not the case, let's just say that this book right here is not the Word of God. It's not inspired, okay? 
And again, I'm saying this is not the case because it is. But here's the question I've got to ask. He says, do you think that if individuals was to just simply mold their life to this book, do you think they'd be a better person or a worse person? Well, I think that every one of us could easily say they'd be a better person, right? You make good decisions. You'd find yourself making wise decisions. You find yourself making uh, making your your paths in a way that you're not going to have to have regret for what you just did. Hmm. The fact is, friends, this book is inspired, and the way in which he he leads us is through mercy, goodness. In truth, that's the way his paths are. And I think it's something that we all can easily learn as well. In verse number 13, those who actually put their trust in him, notice what he says there. He says, he himself shall dwell in prosperity. Now, th th does that mean that we're going to have everything in this life? Are we going to be very prosperous individuals that the world's belongings are going to be just massive within our own uh, houses and things? Or we're going to have like big houses and and very expensive cars and almost anything and everything you want to eat. No, that's not what he's talking about. Those who trust in God will dwell in prosperity. Will they have what they need? Absolutely. David even said in another place, he says, I am, uh, whenever I was young, and he says, even now that I'm old, he says, I have never seen the Lord's people be forsaken. You know, the thing is, God knows His children. He knows who His people are. And because of that, He says, I'm going to make sure that you dwell in prosperity. Those who trust in Him, verse number 13, also has said that they will also inherit the earth. That simply means that the things that are going on within life, physically speaking, is going to be better. Why? Because you'll be making right decisions. The one who is the sustainer of all things in life. Remember how in Acts chapter 17 he says there that it is in him that we live, move, and have our very being, right? So if that be the case, then do you not think that physically we will be prosperous as well? Yes. We'll, we'll have the things of this life. Things are going to be good. Why? Because we're looking to God for guidance. Look at verse number 14. He says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. You know, I want you to think about this. The secret of the Lord is with them. You know what that means? That simply means that the secret things that belong to God, it shows that that togetherness that talks about, have you ever noticed how it's only your true and deepest friends that know your darkest secrets because you feel comfortable enough to expose those things to them? It's those individuals who are your closest and, and most dear friends that they know you more than what you reveal to other people. You start seeing the relationship that you have. And see, that's exactly what we're talking about right here with God. He says, those who trust God has a built relationship with Him, that even the secrets of God is with those who fear Him. He also says that He will also show them His covenant. He's not going to hold these things away from them. He's going to try to show them exactly what needs to be done. If you look at verse number 17, He says, the trouble of, troubles of my heart have enlarged. Therefore, guess what he says? He says, bring me out of my distresses. Why, why would David feel comfortable enough to go to him and ask him that the things that are going on in my heart, they have enlarged. They're, they're a lot larger than, than what's been going on. He says, but God, I want you to bring me out of my distresses. Why did he do that? Because only God has the ability to bring you out of those distresses. And that's a very comfortable thing. He is our anchor. We can rest assured within him. And also in verse number 22, he ends this whole psalm by simply saying this. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. Why, why would he even say that? It's because God has the ability to do just that. If God can deliver us, if God can guide us, if God can teach us, if God can do all those things, then friends, 
Guess what? Why did David trust him? Why did he say that I put my trust in you two times in this, in this uh, text? Why is it that he says that, God, I want you to remember me. I want you to pardon my iniquity. I want you to uh, teach me to wait upon you. It's all because of who God is. He is not a God who's going to do you harm. He's not a God that's going to be changing the way that he does things. He's consistent. He's stable. He'll never do us wrong. Therefore, my friends, the fact is we can trust in God because of who He is. Isn't that good? Even in times of trouble and things like that, we can always find a surety in one place, that being God. The one who is the creator, He's the one who is the sustainer. It's in Him that we live, move, and have in our very being. And therefore, guess what? He'll never change. God says, I am God. I do not change. Therefore, He is an anchor in the sea of, of movable things. You know, I, I want to end tonight's lesson with a simple verse. Look with me at Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4. He says, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that, watch this, friends, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. See, here, here's a beautiful statement. Because of God's goodness, it leads people to live for Him. Because of who He is, understanding His power, understanding His ability, understanding everything that He does, who he is my friends once we understand that then it is the case that we can always lean on him for anything and everything in life but here's a question are we willing to give our lives totally to God or are we not the real statement is why would anybody not want to There's a reason why he says that in all of our distresses, all of our, our weaknesses, even going through sin in our lives, if we are hung up on something, he always says, give it to me. Give it to me. God wants to give us peace. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be the happiest people on the face of this earth. And he has the ability to do that. But friends, we're going to have to choose it. So with that being the case tonight, I hope and pray that you'll evaluate your life, evaluate your trust in Him. And no matter what days are ahead, we know that we have an anchor that we can truly cast and we don't have to be moved. These things don't have to bother us. We can find peace that surpasses all understanding. But will we do it? Are we going to be willing to give our lives totally to God? The, the question, or the answer to that question is only given to you. God's waiting for us. If you're not a child of God, I encourage you to do that. By simply hearing his word, Romans 10 and verse 17. By believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 verse 24. Repenting of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confessing his sweet name before men, Acts 8 verse 37 and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. If you're willing to do that, then you can become knowing the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's the beginning stages. But as Christians, we need to ask ourselves this question. Has our trust failed? Have we become distracted by the things of this world, by our desires and by our lusts and things of that nature? If that be the case, let's come back home. God says that if you will repent and pray, He'll be more than happy to forgive us. He wants to forgive us. If you want to be happy, if you want to know peace, He's ready and willing to give it to us. 
but will we choose that? I hope tonight the lesson has been very encouraging, but I do want you to know that, Lord willing, next week, hopefully Clifford will be back. But until next time, just know that we love you. May God richly bless you. Have a great night.